outro cast. Pete, I'm for me it's good afternoon. For you, it's good morning, right? Yeah, yeah, it's still morning. Well, a two-parter besides how are you is is it Peter Peter and Holmstrom? There's no umlauts in in your Zoom name. Is that Zoom screwing you over? I uh, no, it's it's sort of uh it's just easier in this country to not put the umlauts. Um it just causes problems. Right. I, I have to go back and edit them out so often that I just I kind of leave it out unless it's just for fun. Um it. and it's Pete or Peter. It's like whatever's your whatever's easiest for you, whatever seems right. We'll we'll go with Pete for now. And we were connected to talk about Pete International Airport. Now, as a longtime Dandies fan, I remember that was a track on the Come Down album. Is that where the Pete International Airport name originated, or was that from even before that? I it came from that track in particular, um, which was named after uh Tony Lash, the engineer, um on on that record uh and our first record um he had re recorded me making just a bunch of noise with a bunch of pedals and he, i had came back into the control room and he had titled the track pete international airport so yeah it's he 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 named my my future side project before there was before i even thought about that you know, I, I knew I had I had the name first. <laughs> That's a very good story with all that. Did you have that name going for years or is just when it was time for the solo career? You're going, what should I call it? What should I call it? And that name came to you. Um, I always knew I was going to use that name. Um, I just didn't know when. Um, and. Yeah, I kind of just got just got frustrated with a lot of the ideas I was bringing into the dandies just not being used and right felt like they were they were worth recording and um, yeah just finally got off my ass and did it. You had the George Harrison scenario <laughs> where you went, "These are good songs, uh, got to go solo." Yeah, yeah, I. Yeah, I mean, I just I, I found that, you know, within the dandies, there wasn't enough, um, especially back then, there wasn't enough room for my ideas. Um, and uh, it's a, it was a good thing because I've now managed to, I guess, hone my skills a little bit more and I'm bringing that back into the dandies. Um, um, so much so that I, I co-wrote half the upcoming record with Courtney. So, right. Uh, yeah. As opposed to the token one song. Yeah. The know. first few records are one or two cuts where your stuff would be unfortunately buried. And I'm yeah. sure we as fans want to hear the stuff that did not make the cut, but it's great to hear that you have an outlet that you get to do the major global rock band thing. And then you get to do the thing where you call all the shots as well. Cause a lot yeah. of times when you're in a big band, like for example, not a lot of U two side projects. No, <laughs> but that, that I think that's also a like an an even like they they well, I don't know how it actually works within the band, but it, it definitely they were very collaborative in in and uh, in the songwriting side. You know, it's it's even split. So, or that's what I've heard. Uh, so maybe the need wasn't there. Um, not everybody in the dandies writes music either. It's like, you know, it's like I, I'm constantly doing it, like whether I really want to or not, you know, I pick up a guitar and sometimes something will happen. Right. And one of the collaborations on the latest single, the seven inch, whatever you want to call that is Rachel from slow dive. How yeah. far back does that friendship go back? Um. So that goes back to me seeing a post of hers where she liked my record she she had and i i thought that anton had sent it to her because he had put out my my last record or or somehow she had got it that way but it turns out she had bought it um so i have i have no idea how she even heard of uh, heard of what i was doing um but 
I saw that. And then when the time came and I had a track that was, that I could see her singing on, um, I just reached out, like kind of, you know, I hadn't met her. So mm. yeah, it was, it was just uh, kind of blindly. We'd, ex I think we'd exchanged a few messages here and there, but I hadn't actually met her in person. Hmm. It, um, and you mentioned Anton, sorry to cut you off. It's uh, awesome to see how long that friendship has been going for, because I think the average person who saw the movie dig believed what they saw entirely. Yeah. They didn't see, Hey, this is a professional wrestling rivalry to an extent mixed with creative film editing. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, that's kind of the best way to put it. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of a bummer the way that movie portrayed everything because i mean anton was at my wedding he got up and sang a song and and andy the filmmaker was there yeah and i assume she filmed it she filmed everything <laughs> so but that doesn't you know that doesn't make for her her story you know so it didn't end up in there um, yeah, my biggest takeaway from the film was not the rivalry stuff. It was the interview where Courtney's talking to the journalist, I think in Greece, where he says, you know, we're not a heavy airplay band like Green Day. And they go, actually, and then it shows <laughs> how big the dandies were slash are in Europe. So that maybe the capital deal didn't go as great as it should have over here. But in Europe, you always had that saving grace. You never went out of style, et cetera. You were not a 90s band like idiots might call it. So yes. when I've seen before, it's cool that you get to do your major rock band thing. And then also the thing where you call all the shots. Yeah. That's not a bad career trajectory. It's no, it's fantastic. I'm certainly not complaining. Um, I'm I'm very happy that I get to do. Uh, well, I have. I mean, I'm. I've got far too many projects at the moment. But um, oh, t tell me more about them because I'm sidetracking you with stuff that oh, happened 20 years ago. <laughs> no, well, I mean, it, 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 I don't know. There's. I'm just. I've. I've been another thing that happened during the pandemic besides uh, recording this um, latest um, PIA release. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Jason Adams who was the he was the only singer on the first PIA record and he's another really longtime friend um he wanted to record his sort of solo record and so uh we did that and then uh he put a band together for it and we're in the middle of uh mixing the second record now and that that band's called Sun Adams mm -hmm. also on Little Cloud Records uh um yeah and I've, I've been doing a bunch of remixes and doing some um, music for video games too so oh I, my hands are are quite full at the moment but when you write for video games what name does it come out under it's all my name or pete international airport or both um i, I didn't want to get more confusing <laughs> <laughs> well, another notable thing about you still in portland all these years later but when the dandies took off portland was not this cool tech-centric culturally relevant city like it is now did you ever leave portland in between the early days and now um i made a well yeah i i guess a short little stint in new york um it wasn't anything that I knew was going to, I knew it wasn't going to be permanent by any means. And it, it, it ended up being maybe shorter than even expected. Um, Got it. Besides that. Um, no, um, I haven't. I mean, we, I guess I've thought about leaving a lot, but I don't know where to go. That would be <laughs> better. Um, Cause nowhere is necessarily better. Um, and everywhere is expensive and, I don't know. It's everywhere's not great, I suppose. Everywhere it's not great. That hopefully that's a song title for a future <laughs> Pete International Airport. Oh uh, God, if only I could be slightly more positive. Um <laughs> Yeah, so when where I'm going with that with the Portland thing, 
is uh -huh. you came out of that scene. Everclear did too, although, you know, you were both on Tim Kara Records, although Art thinks of himself as an L.A. person. So how did you know that the Dandies did not have to move to L.A. or New York to make it and get signed? Um, Because I guess because we got signed before we even thought about moving. Oh, I mean, it, it all just happened pretty quick. And then um, and then we were just traveling so much. We were constantly on tour in those those early years that that I don't it didn't matter where we were. Um, probably would have saved a little bit of money if we had moved to L.A. just from the amount of flights that we had like took back back then. It seemed like we were in L.A. probably four or five times a year. Um, but besides that. No, I don't, I, it just never, it, ne it never really even crossed our minds that, that moving would be a good move. And I don't think it would have been, it's like maybe moving to London would have been, sure. uh, would have helped help the career in, in, in some ways, but maybe, a, yeah, you never know. There's that list of bands who did from the States who moved to London. And then that's what made them stand out and get signed, like the Stray Cats and Chrissy Hind, all that kind of yeah. thing. But in your case, somehow with dumb luck, you guys knew, hey, Portland is the future. <laughs> all yeah, the tech companies I, are coming here in Nike. Yeah, I don't. Uh, it's it certainly doesn't seem like that right now. It's pretty it's pretty grim here at the moment. Uh, right. But. <laughs> From from what I can tell, it's pretty grim all along the the West Coast, and maybe maybe the rest of the world too. I don't know. It it is a grim world right now. Unfortunately, we have music like yours to uplift us. That's the optimistic side of it. So, are there gigs planned for Pete International Airport? Um, not yet. Um, I've been trying to figure out what to do with the the live thing. Um. I have this idea that I want to do it as a two piece electronic like thing, like, but try and do it more old school, like no laptops, maybe not even an MPC, just drum machines and sequencers and synths. Hmm. So like old school, they might be giants. I, I was thinking old school, maybe Depeche mode, like from the early eighties kind of thing. Like, um, but I don't know how any of that's done and it's like, and, but that's why I want to do it. Um, but it's also what's kind of holding me back. <laughs> you know, who might know a thing or two, Jeremy Scherer, he might know how to do that. Oh, he does, but he's also a, like super MPC guy. So, um, he, he wouldn't, he would, he would know the modern way of doing it more than the, the, uh, the old school. Got it. So two quick questions and then I'll let you go because you've given me so much information as it is. Uh, the, the first one is when you're not busy with music and I see a lot of incredible guitars behind you, I see jazz masters and whatnot. What's the number two hobby? Cause all these years later, you're kind of a mystery in a good way uh, because music sometimes you want the people to have the mystique and then when you find out that alice cooper plays golf every day it's hard to love the darkness of that when you know that he's on a golf course at 7 a.m yeah 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 um i don't play golf um it, i guess i don't know i uh I mean, there's there's a bunch of art stuff that's going on um, that I'm trying to keep up on because that's that's kind of that's what I went to school for, mm -hmm. um, and I still enjoy doing that. I don't seem to get enough time um, to really do it. Um, I'm also uh, I don't know. I've I'm always been into plants and animals and stuff, so. So, so to paraphrase and rudely interrupt you again, your life is create, create, create. Uh, yeah, uh huh, <laughs> exactly. Because I don't hear any, you know, dumb stuff. Any, well, Real Housewives is my jam when I'm 
bored or feel none of that no 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 i i that's all if i if i watch too many shows or something i start feeling guilty and i pick up a guitar and uh try and write songs so yeah it's i don't know there is there's a bit of a a weird drive going on at the moment that i don't feel comfortable unless i'm making something um and that does lead to uh little bouts of depression because you can't you can't come up with good shit all the time so you know uh and i should feel okay with that but whatever it's it's helping create some really cool stuff so i'm i'm trying to just go with it that makes sense. And the the last question is related to your album. You have members of Cheap Trick, Pang Attack, Dark Horses, A Place to Bury Strangers, etc. on that record. Cheap Trick is one of my favorite bands ever. Now, when I think of the music that I think that Peter listens to, I think of Depeche Mode and Duran Duran. But yeah. were you originally a Cheap Trick guy? Or was that a friendship that was born on, you know, being on the road and running into them at every festival? Um there's actually an, an, a funny story about me meeting Tom. Um, but um, I, Cheap Trick's always been around. Just one of those bands to me, like Tom Petty, where it's like, you just, you don't have to own a record, but you know, like half their catalog. Um, and I think it's just, I don't know, growing up listening to the radio, it just was always there. So, um, but anyway, the story, um i was working as a runner on a on a big stadium show um just during some downtime uh and the show was heart cheap trick and joan jet or heart oh I yeah know, whatever the, whatever order free for all rock and roll hall of fame tour so that's five right. six years ago yeah 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 um and i showed up with a van and and was assigned to cheap trick and i was just sitting and catering waiting for somebody to tell me to go do something um and rick walks out and goes he just takes one look at me and goes you're in a band um not knowing that i was his you know the runner for for his band that day um and i'm like yeah i'm in the dandy warhols and he goes hang on and runs and gets tom because tom's a huge fan so I did not know that um but at that you know from that point on uh we just uh kind of stayed in contact he's wore my t-shirts on stage for for years and so people would always send me photographs it's like did you see this? Tom's wearing your shirt. I'm like, yes, I know. I sent it to him. <laughs> but um, yeah. And then like the, the song that he played on it, it's um, I just, I had, when I sent it to Jason uh, Russo, the singer on that one, um, mm -hmm. it was an incomplete idea and it was not intended for this record. It was going to be for the next one. I thought he was working on a different song but the idea made me think of him. And so I was like, this, this would be a cool thing to do. And so he like finished it and sent it to me. Um, and so then I tried to do a bass part for it and came up with a great bass line that will be a completely different song, but it didn't work with his vocals. And, um, and it just popped into my head Tom, Tom Peterson, and get him to play his 12 string bass on that. And, and he sent it back and it was just so great. In your friendship, when Tom's not available, does Robin Taylor Jr., uh, uh, Robin Taylor Xander fill in for that? I botched that joke. Sorry. <laughs> All good. Um, yeah, no. I think that's really a fantastic thing that to have yeah. a utility player in your band that can fill everyone's parts on a moment's notice because they can do that. You know, kudos to those guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But but the bottom line is, Pete, so great to see you have new music. Really looking forward to what's to come from you as a video game composer, 
your label guy music as yourself as Pete International Airport, the dandies, et cetera, the remixes. Keep up all the great work and thanks for the many yeah. years great art. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to do anything else. So this is pretty much what, what the world's going to get. Outrocast.